Possibly the most hotly debated topic in the publishing industry over the past few years has been the issue of cultural appropriation. Although there is universal agreement that diversity as a goal is commendable, when it comes to the ticklish business of who should be allowed to write what kind of story, things get murky. Issues of voice, authenticity and identity politics are stirred into the pot, and the end result is something that can often lead to controversy. In the first video of this series, I express the opinion that authors should have the right to write whatever they choose, including stories involving characters not from their own ethnic backgrounds. My belief is that to bring more diversity into fiction, the industry needs to reassure writers that, if properly approached, they should have no qualms about introducing such characters into their writing. But there are clearly more complex arguments to be made around the issue. Debates about cultural misappropriation and the historical lack of access to the industry for voices from minority backgrounds. Because of these issues, at present, many people believe that there is a climate of fear in the publishing world. Everyone is terrified of making a mistake, afraid of being charged with the crime of literary misappropriation. Clearly, this has an impact on the sorts of books that are acquired, published and marketed. These are the issues I want to explore in this video. Some time ago, the internet went into meltdown because pop icon Adele had her hair braided into Bantu knots, a traditional African hairstyle. Accusing her of cultural appropriation, numerous outraged Twitter users took to the internet to express their anger, while others leapt to her defence. Who was right? What is cultural appropriation anyway? And why should we care? When we talk about cultural appropriation, what we really mean is cultural misappropriation. The adoption of elements of one culture or identity by members of another culture in a way that is deemed to cause offence. It particularly becomes an issue when the culture engaging in the alleged misappropriation has historically disadvantaged the culture from which it is appropriating, i.e. when one culture is the dominant one and borrows from a weaker culture, any sense of historical injustice can be magnified. The trouble is that the lines are not only blurred, but continually being redrawn as to what might be perceived as offensive. Let's consider some examples. The Washington Redskins football team, after years of petitioning, finally agreed to change its name and logo, that of a Native American in feathered headdress. The logo was deemed racist by many in the Native American population, understandably so, given their fraught history with white colonizers. A second example. Recently, several actors have been criticized for taking on roles outside of their own ethnicity. I'm certain Scarlett Johansson intended no offense when portraying a Japanese character in Ghost in the Shell, yet offense was taken. In this instance, historical context is important, given that her casting followed a long line of such perceived slights by Hollywood. For instance, in the 1930s, white Swedish-American actor Warner Oland played a Chinese detective named Charlie Chan in no less than 16 films. Having said all this, I remain firmly behind the idea that authors and creative artists in general should be allowed to express themselves beyond the bounds of the culture into which they were born. To not have that right would mean that I could never pen a novel with white characters, or set a story in a culture deemed outside of my heritage. But who is drawing the lines here? Who's in charge of what is and isn't permissible for a particular individual or situation? There is, as some argue, a very fine line between cultural misappropriation and cultural appreciation. After all, in an increasingly interconnected world, cultures are continually mixing. It's inevitable that we will see a sharing of ideas, traditions, fashions, symbols, and even language. For me, and for many others, this is a good thing. A way for cultures to understand and empathize with each other, and to normalize what at first might seem different or strange. Of course, there are clearly cases of cultural misappropriation that should be called out. Other instances are beyond trivial, or deliberately misinterpreted. Personally, I think that the matter comes down to common sense and context. We won't all agree on every such situation, but by taking a deep breath before reacting, we might better serve the issues at hand. Having said all this, we must acknowledge that there are instances where authors have incited great angst by writing about cultures outside of their own. In 2009, Catherine Stockett's The Help was published. The book went on to huge commercial success, but was later hit by a deluge of criticism. Stockett, a white middle-class American, had written a story about African-American maids working in white households in Mississippi in the 1960s. The book was accused by many in the African-American community 
of the shallowest portrayal of black people's experiences in that era. Other critics suggested that Stockett had painted lazy, superficial stereotypes, failing not only to deliver the truth of the lives of her black protagonists, but also harming any history lesson that other communities might take from the piece. Let's look at a more recent case. In 2019, the novel American Dirt attracted huge publicity. The book is a story of a Mexican mother and son's journey to the American border after a cartel murders the rest of their family. The book has been criticised by some for misappropriating the stories of Mexican immigrants to America. Up until the book's release, the author, Janine Cummins, had publicly identified as white, only revealing in the lead-up to publication that she has a Puerto Rican grandmother. Cummins' book tour was cancelled due to the level of vitriol she received and concerns for her safety, something that none of us would wish on any author. These two novels represent portraits of cultures beyond those of their authors. Each has met with overwhelming financial success and a barrage of criticism, particularly from the communities they are purporting to empathise with. For some, the mere fact that they were written by people outside of those communities was bad enough. For others, this wasn't an issue. Instead, the problem was that they were written, in the opinion of their critics, without carrying out the due diligence expected of an author embarking on such a mission. In a certain sense, these authors were accused of relying on white privilege and then being rewarded for doing so. The implication being that authentic voices from these communities are rarely given the same opportunity, platform or rewards when they pen such stories. Many writers, including many from minority communities, myself included, have publicly stated that we have no problem with authors writing beyond their own culture. After all, if we think about it rationally, every novel includes some elements of experiences beyond our own. I write crime fiction. I haven't murdered anyone lately, but I have been appropriating the experiences of the minority group known as murderers for years. A problem only seems to arise when authors are lazy, disrespectful, insensitive, or merely using someone else's lived experience to create a titillating story that distorts the actual experience of the community they have chosen to portray. It would not be unkind or incorrect to suggest that the publishing industry has a fear of change, a fear that, should they print a wider range of books, readers might be put off by unconventional names on the cover or challenging settings and protagonists, unless these are written by mainstream authors. This is not a criticism of mainstream authors. There are clearly some who decide to include diverse characters and do a great job of it. One argument is that when popular authors do this, they aid in the process of normalising such characters for readers, thus making it easier for writers from those cultures to portray their own experiences. Again, the other side to this view is that this practice can take opportunities away from already marginalised writers. Ellie Griffiths is one of the UK's best-selling crime fiction authors. Her latest series features protagonist Harbinder Kaur, a female gay Sikh. Ellie is a white straight author with Italian ancestry. When I interviewed her, Ellie told me that she was uncertain about going down this route, acutely aware of her white privilege and the cultural appropriation debate. At the same time, she felt that characters often appear to authors and thus writers should not shy away from using them, though they then have a responsibility to bring those characters to life in a truthful way. As part of her research, she asked a British Asian Sikh friend to read the book. In the event, the book was also passed to the Sikh friend's mother and that older generation viewpoint added a different dimension to Ellie's cultural understanding. For instance, Ellie had named their dog Sultan. Sultan is a Muslim name, not a Sikh one so unlikely to have been bestowed upon the dog in question. As authors, if we do our research, if we set out to highlight rather than to denigrate, to depict a particular culture with truth and empathy, warts and all, then we will have fulfilled the tenets of our creed and should not feel remotely guilty in so doing. I feel that I am on safe ground saying this. After all, in 2019, Booker Prize winning author Bernadine Evaristo, a black woman, stated that it is ridiculous to demand of writers that they not write beyond their own culture. I know that many authors and readers will agree with this, though not all, and that's perfectly fine. In a survey I carried out as part of this project, out of 1,033 respondents, 95% stated that all authors should have the right to write characters from ethnicities different to their own. Again, readers are particularly important in this equation. They can act as a catalyst for change. If given more choice, I am certain most readers would happily embrace a good story no matter how diverse the characters or the author's cultural heritage. In other words, they can make up their own minds. 
In the next video, I'll take a look at how an author's heritage can be both a blessing and a curse. If you found this video useful, feel free to alert others to this project and to download the written guide that accompanies the series from my website. I would also be extremely grateful if you could spend just three minutes filling out the short feedback survey available on my website at vasimkhan.com, where you'll also find further resources. Thank you.